Hi everyone, this is just a brief overview of the causes of the Civil War. So, <clears throat> first off, it's really important to understand that leading into 1850, which is a pivotal year, we'll talk a whole lot about 1850, um, even more specifically in class today, uh, but ultimately what you want to pay attention to is the population diversity. All right, so just notice the way that this chart works, right? Anyone more population more than six, right? I mean, six per square mile, that is. Um, I mean, you see that the population of the, in, of the north and even the Mississippi Valley, as well as the Shenandoah Mountains, the Blue Ridge Mountains, and so on, are relatively dense. Right, whereas you get to certain areas of the, of the South and they're smaller and in the West, very empty. So by 1850, westward expansion was in the equation, but remember that the Mexican-American War had just ended, right? So California and New Mexico and Texas had just recently been acquired in 1846. But yeah, California, New Mexico, and Utah had all been um, had all been seceded uh, by, or not seceded, I'm sorry, they, um, it had been ceded from Mexico to the United States when Mexico lost the Mexican-American War in 1848. All right, that treaty was called the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And I'll spell that for you in class. All right, so Compromise of 1850, this is also huge. So realize that even though California only became part of the territory in 1848, it became a state in 1850. So that means that the population reached the level that is required for it to become a state by 1850. Um, so that's impressive. Um, when California was applying for statehood, the North and South were in a huge argument, disagreement about whether California would become a slave state or free state. So that's where the Compromise of 1850 comes into place. Okay, so uh, basically the way that that worked, and write this down, this is huge, um, is that California was admitted as a free state, much to the chagrin of the southern states, and the um, that made it so that there was a balance because Maine, which broke off from Massachusetts, was admitted as a free state as well. Um, slightly before that, sorry about that, just a little brain moment. Um, and the way that they wanted to balance that out was by admitting something called a popular sovereignty, all right? Um, we talked about that a lot in class last year. Popular sovereignty was the concept that um, no matter what the area, either north or south of the Missouri Compromise Line, which had been in place since 1830, the idea was that the people in the territory, when that territory had enough people to become a state, got to decide on the slavery question, right? So if the people voted for slavery, it became slavery. If the people voted for, free, um, for a free state, then it became a free state. That means that the Missouri Compromise of 1830 was nullified, right? So just cross that out in your brain. As of 1850, this line no longer existed. Some little other things that you don't have to worry about as much is that um, there was a border dispute in this area that was settled by the Compromise of 1850. Uh, the other huge one is that um, the Fugitive Slave Clause of the original Constitution was actually enforced, at least as far as the federal government was concerned, it was meant to be enforced. It was meant to be much more strict. So whether the northern free states liked it or not, if there was a slave, that escaped, say hypothetically, from Kentucky, crosses the Ohio River into Ohio. If that slave escapes, it doesn't matter that he's in a free state. Slave is a slave is a slave, as far as the federal government was concerned. Okay, so it was up to the citizens of Ohio by federal law that they had to return their slaves. 
back to the state in which they came from. Um, one other thing that's really huge and pivotal is that um, in the District of Columbia, or Washington, D.C., they abolished the slave trade. Not slavery, but the slave trade. This was because they didn't really think that it was fair to have um, the federal government where slavery was a huge issue. They didn't think that it was right to be purchasing slaves right at the Capitol. All right, so that was the Compromise of 1850. So again, as a recap, all right, California is a free state, um, and the popular sovereignty issue is, is settled, right? Um, so basically, remember it this way. California is free, popular sovereignty, no slave trade in D.C., little border dispute settled, and stricter fugitive slave clause. Those are the huge ones. Those are the ones you want to worry about for IB. It's not an AP exam, so you don't have to have everything memorized. All right, so um, Kansas-Nebraska Act. This is also huge. We talked about it last year. Um, this is where um, when Kansas and Nebraska territories gained enough um, gained enough citizens to apply for statehood, there was a very significant controversy. Even before they became states, there was a significant controversy because, and Giselle will like this, um, in, in Chicago, there, uh, there was a proposition that was heavily supported by Senator Stephen Douglas, same guy from the Lincoln-Douglas debates, all right? basically uh, wanted there to be a transcontinental railroad that had a terminus, which means a station, from Chicago to the San Francisco Bay Area. In order to do that, it had to pass through this territory here that up until the 1850s was Native American territory. Okay, so to make this territory, they were thinking, oh geez, Missouri Compromise Line. So, like I said earlier, the Missouri Compromise Line was technically nullified by the Compromise of 1850, but it was still there. So, what the Kansas-Nebraska Act does is it divides the Nebraska uh, territory into two halves, right? Nebraska and Kansas, both of which could decide by popular sovereignty. Turns out that Nebraska ends up becoming a free state, but Kansas had a much more controversial start, okay? Because of, um, because of the desire to maintain slavery in, um, in the South, many people from Missouri, which was a slave state, remember Missouri Compromise Line, Missouri was slave despite the fact that every other state after that had to be below the line. Okay, so um, the people in Missouri uh, started to mass migrate across the Kansas-Missouri border so that they would be present for the enact enacting of the Constitution in Kansas. So ultimately what that turns into is a bloodbath. It was actually, um, the Kansas-Nebraska Act resulted in what was called Bleeding Kansas because people were actually crossing the Missouri border with bludgeons, clubs, weapons in order to violently make the decision for Kansas. And this is not just pro-slavery people that are doing this. One of the most prominent examples of a pro-slavery person who uh, was involved in Bleeding Kansas was none other than John Brown. Same dude that was involved in John Brown's raid shortly before the Civil War. We'll get there. All right, so that was a big bloody mess. All right, in 1856, sorry about that. <clears throat> in 1856, um, we have an election, and it does, it's not nearly as significant, obviously, as the election of um, 1860. But just really briefly to give you a sense of the division, the sectionalism um, that existed between North and South. All right, so every red state voted for the Democratic candidate, James Buchanan, and every blue state, that's a typo here, that's John Fremont, there should be an E there, all right, who was a Republican. Um, so as you can see, um, the, the vote, despite the electoral difference, the popular vote really wasn't that far off. And Millard Fillmore was a member of a third party, which were more popular in the 19th century. And he won eight electoral votes, which may seem small, but in the 19th century, that's uh, actually not bad. So, um, it, well, it's a lot better than the 21st century, let's just put it that way. Um, so Millard Fillmore, actually, he was kind of the, um, he was... 
he didn't, he supported the Compromise of 1850. He knew that if the slavery question were decided, the country would go to war. So it kind of makes sense that um, Virginia, as well as the, um, as well as, no, this is Maryland, I'm sorry. Wow, I'm old. Um, Maryland and the District of Columbia is, is slightly unique. Um, but yeah, Maryland as well as, yeah, that's just Maryland. Yep, just to make sure. Sorry, it's a small map. Um, Maryland was uh, the only state that supported Miller, Millard Fillmore, so interesting. Okay, in 1860, way bigger deal, all right? Um, in 1860, Abraham Lincoln um, ends up kind of sweeping the election, not completely, but one of the reasons why this was was because there were more options, all right? So as we talked about in class last year, Lincoln was the much more moderate uh, candidate in the sense that he did not support the total abolition of slavery. He said that slavery should not expand into the unsettled or un, you know, the territories that had not yet become states. All right, so this is why this whole section is non-voting. All right, um, California, Oregon is now also a state. They support Lincoln. Um, and this also shows you how these states actually were, um, were Democratic candidates prior to that. So you also get a sense of like the party flip, which is kind of interesting. But this is such a good example of sectionalism. All right, look how every um, free state or every state that did not have slavery supported, and I'll talk about, I can talk about New Jersey, but don't worry too much about New Jersey. All right. Um, not that it doesn't matter, Ashley, but just don't worry too much about it. All right. So um, basically, uh, these, all the states that support um, the end of slavery, sorry, um, they voted for Lincoln. Okay. Um, Missouri voted for Stephen Douglas, and he was a Northern Democrat, which, um, means essentially that he did not want to, um, he supported popular sovereignty, okay, but he was not, he really did not want slavery to end. I mean, he was kind of just saying that he supported popular sovereignty to try to appease both sides. Um, and obviously, by the number of electoral votes he received, it really didn't work. The only state that liked that was Missouri. Okay, um, John Bell, Constitutional Union Party, kind of similar to Millard Fillmore um, in the 1856 election. Again, now at this point in 1860, slavery is so much of an issue that we'll see in the next slide, the South immediately starts seceding, right? So, I mean, basically, the really important thing to know here with these central states is that um, these basically were the people that knew that if war resulted, that these states were going to bear the brunt of the war, and they didn't want that. So that's kind of why they support John Bell, who supported the Constitutional Union, or basically did not want the country to fall to shambles. So as you guys hopefully remember, when Lincoln was elected in 1860, immediately secession begins. All right, the state that, and this map is awesome because it gives you all the dates. All right, but South Carolina led the way. And uh, you can see also, this, this is a pretty cool map because, I mean, ultimately it shows you the states that never seceded um, and also the states that seceded before, so the darker ones, the states that, se that seceded before um, Fort Sumter, which was when the Civil War began, and um, the states that waited until after Fort Sumter. So you can kind of see just geographically that the mid-southern mid states, the mid-slave states, are really kind of terrified of what's going to happen. So they're not willing to secede immediately. And we'll talk um, in another video about kind of how that pans out. Um, and uh, these, some of the counties even within the South didn't want secession, so that's also important to realize. Um, these states, yeah, again, never seceded, even though they were slave states. So that's kind of a big deal. So um, just real quick recap. Um, so population density is much bigger in the north. Um, the only reason it's as large as, as it is in the south is because of the uh, slave population. All right, Compromise of 1850, right after the gold rush, right after the Mexican-American War. Um, California is a free state, right? Um, and no slavery in the District of Columbia. Um, Missouri Compromise Line still stands, but popular sovereignty is enacted. Um, this is the border that's settled right here, Compromise of 1850, all right? So Texas slightly changes. Sorry about that. 
Um, and last but not least, Fugitive Slave Act, right? The Fugitive Slave Act is more tightly enacted. It already existed, but they enforce it after that. And again, that's a federal law, not a state law. All right, uh, Kansas-Nebraska Act leads to bleeding Kansas, big bloody violent event, the caning of Charles Sumner, as we talked about in class. That happened over Kansas. All right, so bad news bears, the Missouri Compromise line is nullified. Okay, election of 1856, James Buchanan, Democrat, comes from Pennsylvania, um, but he was actually out of the country for, uh, for a lot of the crisis of the 1850s, so it kind of makes sense that the Democrats supported him. John Fre Fremont um, actually was pretty close, and he's from California, which is kind of interesting, too, because it's a new state. Um, okay, election of 1860, you see the clear division between North and South, and you can interpret this map for yourself. Um, and the border states that uh, that seceded, um, the border states that eventually seceded, the states that seceded really quickly, and the um, central states here, the central southern states that never seceded. All right. Um, so in class, we'll talk about this and talk about questions that you might have. Thank you so much for watching.